Hey Patrick, what's going on? Uh, I'm going to quickly send this email link out to the class and then we can get started. So, um, let's see. <clears throat> hey Patrick, what's going on? Oh. Probably hearing a feedback. Uh, I'm going to quickly send this email off of the other live video happening. All right. Um, oh, looks like we got a bunch of people here. Patrick, Nick, Nick, Sam, Hans. All right. Excellent. How are ev uh, shoot. Blah, blah, blah. How is everybody? Um, so uh, we are, let's see, let's just catch up a little bit. Um, so you should have turned in your project last week. I think I got almost everybody's turned in. If you didn't turn it in yet, go ahead and do it. Um, due to the nature of the whole um, COVID thing, I'm, I'm not really going to take off points for lateness just because everyone's in such a, you know, just kind of a uh, very, very different situation. So I'm not going to, you know, take off for lateness or anything. I'm just going to um, you know, award points as normal, as if everything was just on time. So if you didn't turn in a, an assignment or um, some of the assignments, if you check on the grade, uh, were incomplete where there was a missing component. Um, and I, if I commented on that and marked down your grade accordingly, um, you can go ahead and submit those extra parts um, and uh, get the full credit. So it's all... It's all up to you, um, and then if you want to do the do any kind of extra credit, I guess we can maybe come up with something for that. But um, okay, so I haven't had a chance to look at your assignments yet, uh, especially because last week I was finishing up the Jazz Two um, project composition that took a lot longer than I thought it would, and uh, yeah, so I'm gonna try to get that graded and then. Um, today the contrafact is due, so I want to do a couple things. Um, if anyone wants, and I'm going to type this as I say it, if anyone wants to share their contrafact during this class, please say so here. Okay, so... Um, that might be kind of a fun thing is if you have a contrafact that you really like um, that you came up with it would be kind of fun to just share it with the class I can play it on my keyboard here um, yeah I think you can hear that so let me know oh hey Daniel good to see you um, so yeah uh, if you want to share your contrafact let me know uh, we're gonna do a few different things I'm gonna try um, something a little bit different right now um, and I know the stream is on a little bit of a lag so I'm gonna just wait a second to give um, to give you an opportunity to respond but um, we're gonna do some listening as a class over the uh, over the stream and um, what I would like to do is have you share your observations as you listen in the chat. So I'm just going to type those instructions here. Chat. Okay. So today's unit is hard bop and cool jazz, which were the basically the development of the bop language after bebop you know so bebop was 1940s um charlie parker dizzy glassley thelonious monk bud powell uh, max roach you know and a number of other players but those were sort of the the big uh figureheads and after that and that was sort of like world war ii era um, and after that, in the 1950s, you started to have 
some different uh, diffusions of that bop style. So the bop style, the language, the way that the ideas were played over the tunes were sort of um, maintained in a certain way. Like the, the Charlie Parker style didn't really go away. It was just there were some different branches off of the same tree that, that branched off. So one of these would be um, cool jazz, which is what's known as West Coast jazz. And we're going to listen to some examples here of each of these. Um, and that's where they took the bop stuff and then they kind of made it into a little bit more of a laid back um, style. You might hear some more kind of airy phrasing, uh, things like that. So let's um, we'll check out that. And the other thing is the, the hard bop movement, which is kind of, um, in a way, the antithesis to the cool jazz thing. Instead of being lighter and more airy and kind of, um, you know, floaty, it was a lot more hard driving and soul jazz. So, for example, uh, we're going to check out this tune right now called Bernie's Tune which, um, here's the melody. example of a cool jazz tune by um is it by jerry mulligan played by jerry mulligan at the very least um so yeah i believe it was by him um yeah so this is a tune that is a lot more kind of uh light in its phrasing you know but it's still uses the same principles as bop in terms of harmony and language. Um, on the other hand, we have hard bop, which is much more of a, you know, hard driving soul R&B driven jazz. So we're going to listen to a tune called uh, Moanin' by Art Blake and the Jazz Messenger, as many of you have probably heard. Um, if We may have even listened to this at, earlier in the class, but... <laughs> So it's much more blues and um, R&B driven. So um, we'll listen to a little bit of that and maybe not the whole track, but um, let's start with, uh, uh, we're going to start with Jerry Mulligan's Bernie's tune. And um, like I said, please comment in the chat as we go here. Um, and then also, um, if you want to share your contrafact, um, you can just chime in while the song is playing. All right, here we go. Here's Bernie's tune. <laughs> Thank you. 
So um, thanks for the observations, you guys. Um, looks like Nick commented with, Nick Miskamin commented with a uh, cool transition from Jerry's solo to a background at half notes. Um, let's see. Let me just check on. So Jerry's <laughs> So he kind of overlaps with uh, half notes. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, yeah, and that's I'm sure that's something that they probably did not plan. It's probably just something that they did. Um, okay, solos seem to be less of just pure jazz language, if that makes sense. A lot of rhythmic and harmonic liberties. Yeah, so I would say that the cool jazz thing was very much... Um, in a way, kind of theory driven, um, or or very line driven, um, as opposed to lick driven, um, and and that's a generalization. But um, some of the famous uh, cool jazz players were really into like the horizontal lines, as opposed to like you know. Um, 
the vertical harmonies. So, you know, you might... Instead of... Maybe a little bit less chromaticism um, and more, you know, just um, linear lines, I would say. So, yeah, I think um, to Hans's point, that does uh, actually make sense. Um, okay, so Sam uh, says unique use of ensembles color, especially at the beginning. Yeah, the creeping chromatic steps, loud and soft backgrounds. Um, yeah, cool jazz was very, very much about the arrangement in a lot of ways. Um, in fact, we can do a little bit of listening to what's um, oftentimes thought of as, you know, the quintessential cool jazz album called uh, Birth of the Cool, which I'm sure many of you have heard. But um, this was Miles Davis and Gil Evans and... Now all of your faxing needs can be done online with eFax. And uh, the fax machine that they use. No, um, just kidding. Yeah, so... <laughs> Yeah, here's another example. So it's very counterpoint driven. It's in a way it's very much like um like Bach or like Baroque music, but just um jazz, right? So I think um the and also, you see in in cool jazz an expansion of the instrumentation. So, um, you see like French horns, tubas, flute, clarinets um, being used. In the case of that recording, um, we have Bob Brookmeyer playing a uh, valve trombone, which has a really really unique sound. You know, where all the notes kind of pop in a different way, um, more like a trumpet or like a baritone horn. And we have the, you know, the um, the baritone sax, which is uh, obviously something that didn't show up a lot in the bebop era. So um, another th interesting thing is the way that the players use what's called like a breathy tone or like a subtone. So, you know, you kind of get a little airiness to the tone. <laughs> instead of more of like a hard driving and we'll see that the the hard bop thing was more about that big sound but this is more about you know um more of a breathy subtle sound and then the other thing is with rhythm section, you'll hear that they use brushes a lot in um, cool jazz. Okay, so um, so Patrick says, uh, I like the backgrounds at the beginning of the trombone solo, simple, but they help the transition. Um, let's see. Yeah, let me go back and listen to that. Uh, actually... Uh, well, let's see. Maybe there won't be an advertisement. <laughs> um, let's see. Yes, there's an eFax ad, as as always. Um, I use eFax once to submit some tax documentation for this whole uh, this whole virus thing, and then I get all these ads. Okay. <laughs> trombone solo. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, that's nice. 
I, I wonder if they planned that or if it was just uh, spontaneous. Um, okay. Um, Hans first, LOL. I think you're referring to the um, circus theme. The ba 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 da 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 da. And then they, I think that's probably just improvised. You know, someone played it and then they harmonized it in a goofy, you know, um, a goofy harmony with lots of, of uh, tension. Okay, seems like they're conversing in one circle. Yeah, no, that's good, Nick. Um, they, yeah, they seem to have some group improv happening near the end. And that's pretty cool. Daniel says there were a couple of moments where the solos borrowed different lines from each other and put their own spin on it. Made them all the solos somewhat cohesive, but added some individuality. Good, yeah, that's a good good observation. Um, and that's what a composer would do, right? They would use thematic motives to um, basically keep a tune within a certain cohesion. And as improvisers, we try to do that as best we can. So um, Nick says, love the last chord. Yes, absolutely. So um, good observations, you guys. That's really good. We're going to transition to a hard bop tune. Actually, um, you can check out Moaning on your own. Uh, I'm going to play a different tune just to give it a variety because that one is so common. Um, but this is Horace Silver's The Preacher. And you'll hear that it's a lot more kind of all about like the soul the kind of the R&B blues influence. Um, as the name suggests, you know, it sort of has a, like a gospel influence too. So here we go. And again, um, go ahead and put post your comments as we listen.
cool. Um, one of my favorite tunes. It's one of the first jazz tunes I learned. Uh, I was in uh, eighth grade, and my middle school jazz combo played it, so it was it was fun. Um, okay, uh, Nick Miskamin says the harmony in the head with the tenor sax and trumpet is really awesome. Dissonant harmonies are contributing to the style a lot. Yeah, I agree. I really love the. Um, the whole steps here, so I'll just play it from the beginning. Right there. So that landing, so it's in the key of F, right? C, D, F, and then it lands on a, like a, a F6 chord. And then it turns into an F7 chord, and it's got the flat seventh against the root to create that crunchy whole step. So it's major thirds, you know, and so that's a really cool, cool use of that. And then you got the, those are just guide tones. So um, when we do the guide tones at the beginning of the semester, you know, it really does show up. I mean, you know, sometimes I think in jazz improvisation, we get a sense that, hey, you know, we learn this really basic stuff like playing chord tones and, you know, playing the roots and playing the thirds and sevenths. And it seems kind of, I don't know, kind of fundamental and basic sometimes, like, you know, is it really what people do? And then you listen to the stuff, and, and they do. I mean, you know, a lot of times these harmonies are just based on guide tones. So um, so just uh, don't sleep on guide tones would be the, the moral of that story. But um, let's see. L uh, Sam says, like, the last tune has some intentionally streamed harmonies between parts, like piano and horns in the head, but it is in the gospel style like you mentioned. Yeah. So, um, so like, so the major blues scale, which is just an inversion of the minor blues scale, has that one, it's a major scale, one, two, sharp two or flat three, three, five, six, one, so... So you have a minor blues scale, which is the one everyone learns. Um, and then this one, the major blues scale, is um, just an inversion. So it's like you have the relative minor and the relative major in a major scale. So this would just be the major version of a D minor scale, just so it goes up a third. And now we're in F. So, um, cool. Um, and that gives it that bluesy style. But, um, yeah, like you said, the gospel style, you know, it does have that kind of uh, soulfulness to it, melodicism, and kind of that feel-good rhythm and feel-good harmony. Um, cool. Patrick, the drums are there to keep time and feel good not much crazy polyrhythmic stuff um yeah exactly it's it's very very feel good just groove in the pocket you know there's some stuff that's kind of like like hitting a right there and sort of accenting certain things and kind of bringing out a certain intensity, but it's really, you know, it's not, um, it's not that busy, you know. Uh, okay, Daniel, unlike the last tune, this seems to be less rhythmically driven. Both the melody and utilize, utilize a lot more space, and it's much more laid back in tempo and rhythm. Yeah, so it, I would say it's rhythmically driven, but not rhythmically as active, maybe. Um, so, like, the style of rhythm is more driving, but the it's not, like, all about busyness, 
per se. Um, you know, it's very much, um, well, you know, in a sense, like a preacher standing up and delivering a, um, a sermon or a message or a speech, right? So, you know, I think that's part of it is that there's this quality of it that it's like, it's very um, speech-like, you know, and and it's simple and just say what you have to say and, um, you know, say it clearly. So, um, let's see. But yeah, that's definitely true. It's it's super laid back and um, and has a really nice feel good groove to it. Nick Miskimin, both trumpet and tenor sax were rhythmically active. It's really cool when soloists connect the chord changes with their continuous lines. Yeah, so uh, oftentimes that's the the way that horns interact with a jazz combo is, you know, they don't have chords, so they they can you know, only make the most out of one note at a time. So often what they do is they just, they use their lines, right? So, um, so oftentimes horn players are kind of more apt to be um, active rhythmically with what they do and a lot more line driven because that's all they have. Well, not all they have, but it's, they don't have, you know, multiple notes to, to give it sort of a harmonic feel. But, um, I want to bring your attention to a couple things. Um, so listen to the, the way the piano comps. One, do da, do da, just like a drummer. Do go go, do go go, go go. So very much, um, you know, the piano has a, a harmonic role and very much a groove roll at the same time. Listen to the way it comes. So listen to how melodic the top line of the solo of the uh, comping is. Bump, bump, boo da. Ba da. Da da da. It's almost like the piano player is is very vo vocal um, and sort of sharing, you know, responses to what the soloist is playing. Ba, 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 ba da You know these little. These little statements in between the horn solo. So, um, you know, very much feeling um, like the comping is is melodically driven. I would say. So, um, yeah. All right. So, uh, really good comments, you guys. Thanks for for doing that and for chiming in. So, um, let's see, this is, I mean, you know, honestly, just like every other subject here in the jazz improv class, um, this is much more of an overview than a deep dive into any one of these styles, because you could really get deep into any of these, you know, artists and styles. And, um, I would say, um, that that would be something that I would have you guys, you know, explore on your own. Um, again, I think to be a good jazz player, just like any other style of music, you have to just be deep into the listening of that style. So, um, you know, I would say once you kind of find the artists you like, and even, even if you're just listening to expand your horizons, maybe you're not you know, completely in love with something, but you're just listening to it because it's good to listen to. Um, just listen, listen on repeat, you know, put it on while you cook, while you clean, while you go to bed, while you, you know, do your homework, just have the sound of this music playing because that's what's going to do it. That's what's going to give you the language you need and the, not only that, but, but the feel and the, just the general sense for the music, you know. 
So, um, all right, so let's take a look at these tunes now because I've um, put them in the, uh, what do you call it, canvas. And the assignment, I'm just going to flip over here to the assignment. Um, you can see is to take a hard bop, cool jazz, or bebop tune and record the melody and an improvisation. Try and use enclosures, which again are chromatic notes surrounding a chord tone, and chromatic leading tones such as the bebop scale. Okay, so I want to just say something about this, which is this is a very bare bones um, assignment description, but you will get out of it what you put into it. So um, what I would recommend is to pick a tune and really, you know, work on it and try to, you know, get into the style as much as possible. Here are the tunes that I've uploaded for you. So I try to always have some lead sheets for you if you want to um, use the ones I, I give you that's cool. But if you have other tunes in these styles you like, then you can use those too. Um, th these are just so that everyone can have access even if they don't own a real book or a fake book. So the first tune that we listen to, Bernie's tune is up here. And um, I have have a lead sheet here. All right, and I'm just gonna play through this, uh, play through the um, chords here. So, D minor, key center. Okay, so um, we talked about enclosures, which in this case, we can use the chord tones over D minor seven. So basically what that means is we're just going to take a half step above as an E flat, half step below as a D flat or C sharp, and we're just going to arrive at D. And then we're going to do the same thing for the third of the chord as an F. So we just basically enclosed all the chord tones of a D minor seven. Then we can do the same for a B flat seven, uh, B flat nine, which is like a dominant seventh with a nine added. Okay, and then E flat or E minor seven flat five. A seven. Back to D. So um, another way you could do this is you could have a scale running up. So you could kind of add it into a scale. One, two, three, four, five. And then enclose half step up, half step down, and back to the note you were on. Or another thing you can do is just... Um, kind of add a chromatic scale wherever you want. You could just be. Okay, that's another way to add some harmonic complexity. Um, another thing you can do is you take this, uh, you take each chord tone and you just approach it from below as a chromatic leading step. So you go C sharp to D, E to F, G sharp A, B C, C sharp D, and then you do the same thing for each chord. Okay, so um, Another thing you can think about doing is taking the key center of the tune, in this case D minor for the A, 
and doing the blues scale because it's a minor. And at, at the very least, weaving it in somewhere. So you could do a, a scale. You know, you could um, switch from the, the kind of the main scale, which would be a D minor of some kind. You could do D harmonic minor, D melodic minor, D natural minor, or D um, Dorian minor, because they're all kind of fair game in this situation. I personally love the um, melodic minor sound over a tune like this. Okay, and then the B section is the B section is um, in the key of B flat major because it's it's that same rhythm check sec, uh, rhythm changes chord progression. One six two five one six. transitions back to D minor. So if you want to do Bernie's tune, you're basically dealing with, you know, 16 bars of D minor of some kind, and then it goes into some different chords, but um, but it's sort of all centered around D minor. And then it goes into just rhythm changes A section for the B. So it's something you're familiar with. So you could just play the B flat major scale, B flat blues, um, any kind of B flat uh, bebop scale. Or you could arpeggiate the changes. Or whatever you want to do. Okay, so that's um, Bernie's tune. And let's go to the next one. Um, this is, let's see, The Preacher, since we listened to that. So... This one's pretty fun and simple. Um, and by the way, if I say anything in this uh, lecture that's kind of like, what was that? Just comment. I'll try to address it. Um, okay, so this one's based in the key of F. So pretty blues based, um, 16 bar form. So a little bit shorter form than the other one. So it goes from a F major scale to an F mixolydian scale with a flatted seventh from bar one to two. That's very much like the blues where it goes to the four chord, the sharp four diminished, and then back to the one with just an inversion. Back to the one. And then this is like in classical theory, like a two of, or a five of five, because it's a two chord, but it's a dominant, so it's a secondary dominant. G7, five of C, which is the five chord. So it's a five of five going to five, and that's something you commonly see in these blues tunes, right? It's like, kind of has that nice um, stretch to it where it stretches out the fourth of the scale into the sharp four, and then it leads nicely into the B flat, which is the seven of C, so it gives it a little counterpoint, and then flat seven and then five of um, five of six basically so it's like five of the relative minor but it doesn't actually go there it goes back to like the blues thing four sharp four diminished um, one but an inversion and then six two five one so over this whole thing you could kind of play over F the whole time Right. 
so you can kind of play some kind of fun blues licks. Um, now, uh, if we were to do the enclosure and encirclement and chromatic leading tones here, we could go. So that's just leading into every chord tone from a half step below. Okay, so, or, um, So if you're a piano player, you can do all those cool like blues, kind of almost boogie woogie uh, or um, R and B kind of licks. Uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of the style there. Um, and then I also have some other tunes in here, like uh, Mercy, 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 which is another um, hard bop tune. And then uh, Line for Lions, another cool jazz tune, which is another kind of more line driven piece horizontal harmonies or horizontal lines as opposed to vertical harmonies so um let's see Sorry from all the wrong notes, but that's the idea. It's so it's pretty much a lot of uh, similar types of harmonies, two fives, you know, some somewhat based around a diatonic key center of G, um, and then it kind of transitions to some different key centers in the B section. Although they never get too far out of the realm of G major, they just temporary to temporarily tonicize other key centers. Um, all right, so. There's that, uh, Mercy, Mercy, Mercy. Many of you have probably heard that one. Um, Cannonball Adderley. This one's nice because it just goes between one and a four chord for a while. You know, and then it's got a a B section. This one's more of a funk tune. Um, you know, the, the groove is actually pretty cool. It's got kind of like a funk groove, but real laid back. Um, and then the final tune that I've included in here is Monin, which um, we didn't get to listen to today, but um, probably the, maybe the quintessential hard bop tune. You know, it's the... So that's a real classic one. Also kind of has that preachery, kind of gospel-y feel to it. Blues, definitely. Um, so 
you can pick your your tunes that you want. Um, play them with a backing track. Play them by yourself. Whatever you're most comfortable with. I know some of these will have backing tracks for free online. Some of them may not. But um, but that's the idea. So um, I look forward to seeing what you come up with. Uh, I want to finish by just doing a little kind of extra demonstration on some of the the ways that we can um, make the most out of these these assignments. So like one thing you can do is you can go to the recording and you can just pick up little licks. So like let me go to um, let's do Mo uh, because we didn't get a chance to listen to it. Let's just go ahead and and use that as our first as our example for how to pick up vocabulary. Because we always talk about vocabulary, you know, all the jazz players are like, you know, learn your licks, learn your vocabulary, be able to put your vo vocabulary in language. And those can sound kind of like confusing terms, like, well, what is, what is language? What is vocabulary when it comes to jazz? Um, and basically, it's just thinking of jazz as like that oral tradition that it is, right? It's passed down through sound as opposed to purely just being passed down through, um, you know, notated sheet music. Obviously, it has both aspects to it, but, um, but I would say we, we really need to make sure that we preserve the fact that it's taught by ear as well. So I'm just going to... Play a little bit of this uh, trumpet solo by Lee Morgan. So this is like an all-star cast. It's Lee Morgan on trumpet, Benny Golson tenor sax, Bobby Timmons piano, Jimmy Merritt bass, and Art Blakey on drums. So it's like you know one of the one of the classic. <laughs> going to transcribe that one lick. So it's a pretty simple lick. If you're thinking in the key of um, F minor, it just goes to the 6, the flat 3rd, the 1, and the 6 again. So D, A flat, F, D, speaking in concert key. Right there, I just picked up a couple of really cool pieces of language that I can use in my own solo. Even if I just transcribed that much. I just took that one idea really it's just two ideas but it's kind of the same idea with a little bit of a variation on it and I just took that and spun it out into 16 bars of improv so that's what I mean and that's what people mean when they say learn your language and vocabulary <laughs> scale by the way okay so we're just picking up little licks doesn't you don't have to transcribe an entire solo to get some look uh, some language and vocabulary <laughs> Sometimes we're so intimidated to get in to take some ideas out of a, tr a solo because we think we have to do this whole 
huge process and transcribe only the coolest licks. But if you just transcribe just these little bits and pieces that you think sound cool, you can just take a little piece of that and just put it in your solo right now, you know? <laughs> That's so easy. All I'm doing is copying what Lee Morgan's doing in his solo. But I'm just trying to adapt it and do something my own style with it. So, um, okay, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to go eat dinner and um, spend time with my family. But um, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, once again, I will be kind of catching up on the grading. And um, please let me know if you have questions on this. Um, I know jazz improvisation just has so many facets to it, and I, I'm definitely empathetic with that because I deal with it every day, and I teach it to students of all ages, and so um, if you have questions about stuff, let me know. Um, again, I think there's so many resources online and, and just even talking to each other, um, you know, that um, I really think it's incumbent on you to do a lot of searching when you're doing these assignments to try to, you know, improve your um, sense of vocabulary. And certainly if part of that searching is asking me a question on email, um, I would be all game for that. So, uh, and then also if you, if you ever feel like, man, you know, I really want to be able to, you know, address some of these concepts in person, I could always do like a, a, a short Skype or Zoom session or something like that. So don't, don't be shy. Reach out to me. Um, I'll try to do my best to respond and to be on top of that. So um, awesome, guys. Well, hey, have a great week, and um, I look forward to seeing what you come up with on this. Have fun with it, and we'll see you then.